<laughs> Welcome, um, everyone, to Humanist Canada's uh, 2021 webinar series. I'm Anna Popovich, and I will moderate today's conversation. This webinar is 60 minutes in length, with time allotted to Q&A at the end of Teal's presentation. Just a reminder that you're attending in listen-only mode. If you have questions, please type them uh, with the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen and uh, we'll address them at the end of the presentation. You can also upvote a question to move it to the top of the list. Um, our topic today is municipal prayer in Canada after Mouvement Laïque Québécois versus Suguenay, the Quebec secular movement versus Suguenay. And uh, we are joined by Dr. Thiel Phelps Bondaroff. Thiel is a researcher and community organizer. He holds a PhD in politics and international relations from the University of Cambridge and two BAs in political science and international relations from the University of Calgary. Thiel is the research coordinator for the British Columbia Humanist Association and the director of research for Oceans Asia a marine conservation organization based out of Hong Kong. He is also the chair and co-founder of the Access BC campaign for free prescription contraception and the volunteer member of the board of the Greater Victoria Placemaking Network. His academic research examines the strategic use of international law by non-state actors. Uh, welcome, Teal. Thank you so much for joining us again. And over Thanks to for you. having me. Yeah. We'll, we'll jump right in, friends. Well, I see some folks just trickling in here, so um, I, I might pause in the middle of my presentation for questions as well, because we're going to cover a lot of ground. But let me uh, get my slides up here. There we go. Excellent. Hi. Yes. So um, thank you so much for that fantastic introduction. We are talking about whatever happened to Saguenay, looking at municipal prayer in a post-Saguenay Canada. And I'm going to cover a bunch of ground. Here's some of the fun logos of the organizations I work with. Uh, just for folks who are not in British Columbia, I will note uh, very briefly that uh, my work with the Access BC campaign has been spreading beyond our lovely little province here. And we have sister campaigns in Ontario, Manitoba, and uh, a bunch of the parties in the ongoing Yukon election have um, endorsed our policy. So if anyone's living around Canada and wants to step up to fight for equality and increasing access to prescription contraception, uh, look for a group in your province. If you don't have one and want to set one up, please get in touch. We're happy to help. Uh, and if you want more information about my own work um, that's not necessarily linked to the BC Humanist Association, um, your one-stop shop for everything Teal is <laughs> teal.ca. I've got a link to all the publications I'll be talking about and some of my other work on marine conservation and um, some more academic content. And if you're tweeting along at home, I'm at TLPB on Twitter. So what I wanted to talk about just very briefly is the overall research agenda, the research program of the BC Humanist Association. Um, I, we've been very fortunate to be able to expand our research capacity. I've already spoken to, uh, to folks um, previously about some of our other work. We've been looking at a wide range of issues lately. So we've looked at places of worship and tax exemptions. We've just put out an article, um, a report on this, and I will uh, pop some links in the chat after the presentation. Uh, we've been looking at crisis, pre crisis pregnancy centers and maternity homes, and our research team is currently looking into those. Um, we have teams working on uh, secular invocations and different various ceremonies, including marriage ceremonies and officiants. We had an amazing uh, researcher this summer working on medical assistance and dying, and we have been churning out research on legislative prayer. And that's what I'm talking about today. I'm going to focus on our work on legislative prayer. It's taken two prongs. The first is looked at prayer at the provincial and federal legislatures across Canada, as, and we've taken specifically a deep dive at prayer here in British Columbia. Uh, British Columbia has uh, daily sessions of our legislature start with prayer, and we've been analyzing those quantitatively for the past three years. Um, and after that project, we've been looking at uh, prayer in municipal councils. So the plan here is to talk a bit more about prayer at those municipal councils. And so let's talk about Saguenay briefly. I know many folks here will be familiar with it, so I won't spend too much time, um, but it is worth sort of summarizing what Saguenay was. The overall summary of Saguenay is a decision of the 2015 decision of the Supreme Court um, in the case Mouvement Lake Québécois um, versus Saguenay. And it explored the question of whether or not you can start a municipal council meeting with prayer. And the Supreme Court ruled that you cannot, that this is a violation of the state's duty 
of religious neutrality, and this is a democratic imperative. So taking a bit of a deeper dive into Saguenay itself, it starts in December 2006 when Hélène Simoneau, a resident in Saguenay, Quebec, um, objects to council opening its sessions with prayer. The, the policy is not changed initially, and so he pursues it to the Commission des droits des personnes et des droits de, de la jeunesse, the, basically the, the part of the BC, the, the Quebec Human Rights Tribunal process. And during this time, the city of Saguenay amends its bylaws in an attempt to make them something more accommodating, basically allowing people to step outside during the prayers. Um, and the Human Rights Tribunal finds that this prayer is discriminatory. That is a substantial violation of Mr. Simoneau's rights. This is then appealed, or this then the Quebec Court of Appeal reviews the case and they have an alternative finding. Uh, they determine that, uh, oh, skip the second there. Uh, they find that uh, neutrality does not require the state to abstain from involvement in religious matters. And they, they feel that prayer reflects universal values. And for those listening at home, I am using heavy air quotes there. This case is then appealed with the Mouvement Lake, um, Quebecois, has appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada and it upholds the ruling of the tribunal. And it orders Saguenay to cease, including prayer in its municipal council meetings, and it awards uh, Mr. Simoneau $30,000. So this ruling is significant because it doesn't just apply to Saguenay, it applies across Canada. And right after Saguenay, there were stories of municipalities immediately changing their practices. Some mayors doubled down. And I wanted to explore a couple elements of Saguenay because they're, they're worth highlighting. The first one is the duty of neutrality. This is Canada's separation of religion and government clause. Basically, the court determines that as an interpretation of all the accumulation of evidence in previous court cases and our charter, the state has a duty of neutrality in the context of freedom of, of conscience of religion, that it must remain neutral. And critically, it defines what neutrality means. A lot of um, jurisdictions have battled about what is neutrality, and this is the definition established by, by Saguenay, paragraph 137. So the state can neither favor nor hinder religion. It has to abstain from taking a position. So what, in, this, in this way, it, um, any, any uh, practice, and this is the last part I wanna highlight particularly, even if a religious practice is, um, that is implemented by the state is inclusive, it may nevertheless exclude believers. So even an attempt at ecumenicism or very vague fluffy prayers still would discriminate against non-believers and that's not neutrality. Um, and the example I like to use here, and this is explored in Saguenay as well, is that the difference between um, supporting something and not supporting something, um, the state can either support nor not support religion. It has to remain neutral and have no position on it. Um, and that's it, a very clear um, example in Saguenay. The example that's used is um, the, the opposite of prayer in the legislative council wouldn't be not prayer, it would be starting council session with an affirmation that there was no God. Neither of those two extremes or those two options are available. The state must remain neutral. And, and so basically anytime the state does express a preference, it is making so it's so that a public space is no longer neutral and that is discriminatory. And this is another example from Saguenay where basically you, the state has a duty to uphold the neutral nature of public space so that everyone is equal and everyone's able to equally enjoy that space publicly. And so this is sort of critical rulings from Saguenay. But in, in the fallout from Saguenay, oh, just, just lastly, um, Saguenay does mention that the alternative is to create a hierarchy of belief, where one belief is ranked above other beliefs, and belief itself is ranked above non-belief. And that creates a situation where the state is not being neutral, public spaces are not equally accessible, and people who don't believe, or even people from non-majoritarian religions, are discriminated against. And so this is the democratic imperative, right? Because if you go to your council meeting and you want to talk, everyone should be treated equally. Actually, just before this meeting, I was sending out to messages to my council as they're debating lowering speed limits here in Saanich. And it would be a, a dramatic impact on our democratic process if some people were able to have more access or greater um, involvement in their local government because of their beliefs. However, despite this, um, mayors right after Saguenay across the country, several mayors are quoted as sort of doubling down and committing to prayer. This is from a Lori Beeman's recent book, which I, I definitely recommend. It's an excellent read on, on, on prayer and, and religion and culture. And a bunch of mayors doubled down. So this is an example from the mayor of Oshawa. What happened, um, and so the, the background of the, the research we've done here with BC Humanists is immediately after the um, 2018 inaugural council meetings here in, in BC, uh, 
we had reports of municipalities including prayer in their council meetings. And um, for example, right here in my uh, my municipality of Saanich, we had um, we had two prayers in our inaugural meeting, and that was primarily an inaugural meeting. So we launched this project here, and the idea was to explore how many municipalities across BC did have prayer because we had a few reports, and so we launched our, our research project into. Uh, into BC municipalities. And our summer researchers did such a good job covering all of municipalities in BC, all 162 of them, that we decided to expand the project across the country. Uh, to date, our amazing research team has looked at 1,251 municipal websites, um, and we've, we've scoured those. And I'll quickly talk about the, um, the process that we followed. So there's two instances when prayer can occur in a meeting. The first are inaugural meetings and the second are regular sessions. And we, uh, we wanted to look at both of those because there's often the perception that an inaugural meeting is somehow more important or it tends to have more ceremony. There's usually bagpipers and speeches and swearing in ceremonies. And there seems to be more of an inclination to include prayer because of it's sort of the, the historic nature of this is sort of affirming and uh, being part of, an, of, a, of the ceremony of a meeting. Um, and we also want to look at regular sessions. Now, the Saguenay case was about regular sessions, but it doesn't really matter. You can't start a regular session with prayer. You can't start an inaugural session with prayer. And so what we did is our team looked at uh, meetings before and after Saguenay as well to look at, to determine whether or not the ruling had had an impact on the practices of municipalities. We did find a lot of municipalities that changed, but um, it's really hard to establish a causal link in that situation. Um, principally because one never knows if they just discontinued the practice because it was perceived as antiquated or they were following Saguenay or, or for some other factor. Um, our amazing research team, which um, it, two summers ago was Noah Lawrence, Noah, Noah Lawrence, Renil Prasad, and this summer was Alexandre Otavo Morin and Adriana Thom. And Adriana has been doing the heavy lifting um, on basically the, uh, every municipality in the country um, in the last th few months. Um, and I think she probably has the record for the person who has looked at the most municipal websites in the country. Um, and some of them are not very well designed, I must say. <laughs> but uh, so I have to uh, definitely tip my hat and, and offer lots of respect to our amazing research team who've been scouring websites. And basically what they've been doing is they've been looking through the minutes of meetings um, and watching videos of meetings. And for inaugural sessions, they would skim through the inaugural meeting, look through the minutes, look at the video. Um, for regular sessions, they would look through agendas, watch a couple of random sampling of meetings, if those are available, and then sample a random collection of agendas. Um, and then if we couldn't find the answer, they would reach out directly to municipalities e with email and phone um, and having an exchange around that. And there's sort of a constant uh, stream of communications around that. And so um, once we've identified a prayer, what we would do is um, we enter it into our database, which we've been building, and we record who says it, the procedures around that prayer, um, and you know, we, and and if we can identify the person, uh, their their religion and their gender, and the procedures around prayer vary considerably. And I'll mention them as we go across the country. We found that there tends to be um, for inaugural sessions, there tends to be an invited guest who delivers the prayer. And that person, we were then able to identify their religion and their gender because their, their, their name and their image um, and their affiliation is often listed in the minutes. And then for regular sessions, we found a, a wide range of practices. So sometimes guests, but more typically, um, the mayor will read a prayer invocation or reflection. Um, and in other situations, a rotation of counselors will read an invocation or a reflection at the beginning of a council meeting. And that, that, that there's considerable variation in practice and you can actually start to see some interesting trends in, in political culture um, emerging across the country um, as we look at these. And we also, um, once we've identified the prayers, if there was audio uh, visual recordings of them, we would transcribe them. Um, for inaugural sessions, we transcribe the full prayer. And then for regular sessions, we would transcribe a random sampling of three prayers. And we did this not um, with a desire to do quantitative analysis because in many instances, the sample size was too small, but we did it to sort of give a, a, a flavor of what was going on. Uh, we found that when we transcribed the prayers here in British Columbia, uh, we found some rather startling content. Um, some, and I think um, Adriana just sent me like a three page sermon from a municipality in um, Manitoba. And so those are sort of included as sort of an example of some of the problems that arise around legislative prayer and municipal council meetings. We are still, uh, the process is still ongoing. So we are still transcribing some of the prayers uh, for some, uh, for Ontario particularly. And um, I'll talk a bit more about sort of our, our general research, our plans with the research in a little while. 
but basically we went uh, province to province. And so we started with British Columbia and we went east to west. And the method we, we adopted was uh, we wanted to put some limitations um, on the project. There are over 3,500 municipalities across Canada, but some of them are very small and very small municipalities tend to not necessarily have a detailed audiovisual recordings of all of their meetings as one can expect. So we had some limitations. So for British Columbia, because it is our bailiwick, uh, we looked at every municipality, including Jumbo Glacier and some of the very small um, ski resorts. But for other provinces, we looked at the top 50 municipalities. And then if we identified a prayer in those top 50 municipalities, we would look at every municipality with a population up to 1000. And um, so you'll see when I'm reporting the numbers on the provinces that we sometimes there, there weren't that many municipalities in the province. Sometimes we had more than a couple of hundred because of the, the populations and the, the way we identified prayer. So this is part of sort of our, our broader research plan. And, and the plan is that um, we, we, the BC Humanist Association would like to be releasing reports on each province or region, depending on, on the size, um, in the coming months. So we're in the process of writing at Manitoba, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario. And the idea is that we do a similar report to our duty of neutrality uh, beyond Saguenay. This is our BC report, and I'll, I'll pop a link into the chat uh, momentarily. Um, but basically, the um, the idea is to release these reports, to hand them off to our, our humanist, atheist, secular allies in various provinces who can then use that research and that data to help drive their advocacy efforts. And we've actually had a lot of success here on the ground in British Columbia, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that and how we've linked this research to advocacy. Um, because it's one of the, the, the driving goals of our research team. In addition to producing you know, quality peer reviewed research, we also develop you know, design research to help pursue advocacy goals and of course, the main goal being the separation of religion and government. So uh, let's take a, a jaunt through Canada, if it will. Um, I will note that we are still in the process of gathering this data. And so there's a few instances where we don't know. And um, that, that's always inevitable. Municipal websites are down. They're out of date. We're still trying to communicate with them. So uh, I will report those numbers as well. And we, we can't infer anything from those. Of the 162 municipalities in British Columbia, we looked at every single one of them. We found 23 opened their inaugural sessions with prayer, and none of them opened their general sessions with prayer. And I want to explore these in a bit more depth, and this is the kind of depth we'll be exploring their data for each province. Um, when we looked at those prayers, we have the name and religious affiliation of each person who delivered them, and in some instances the transcription, we found that 100% of them came from Christian sects, um, and 17 out of 23, or 73.9%, were men. Um, so there's a, a preliminary trend. I should also note that we excluded um, some, some sort of edge cases from our data set, and that was particularly Indigenous territorial acknowledgements, welcomes, and blessings. So there was a number of municipalities that had these elements as part of their inaugural meetings, and a lot of uh, BC and a lot of other Canadian municipalities also have a territorial acknowledgement as part of their regular sessions. But we excluded these from the case because, well, for example, there was a First Nations prayer or a blessing in Kelowna, Powell River, um, one here in Saanich. We excluded these because we couldn't really classify them as prayer akin to the ones that were involved in the Saguenay case. Uh, we, we published another report on this called Decolonizing Legislative Prayer. And um, again, I'll put a link to that after and we, there's something, there's sort of a more complex space relating to these elements. Uh, they, kind of, there's, they kind of walk a line between a traditional welcome and a territorial acknowledgement. And they obviously also have a role to play in reconciliation. And they, it seems to be different than starting a meeting with an invocation, a Christian invocation or religious invocation, than um, a territorial acknowledgement or indigenous welcome, even if the indigenous welcome has sort of potentially religious elements to it. And again, it also seems problematic to describe these as prayers as such. They're, they're kind of they're rooted in an effort to acknowledge the harms caused by colonialism, um, preserving traditional cultures, and they're part of the journey of reconciliation. And also, there is that question of whether they actually are a religious practice or not. Now that there was a court case here in BC about this in Port Alberni, and this hasn't been tested out in the courts. So rather than, than litigate that in our report uh, and reports, we, we explore that issue in the reports, but we, we exclude those instances where it's specifically identified as an Indigenous welcome or blessing or prayer um, as a separate case. And we've highlighted those and we will highlight those in each report, although I won't be reporting those in the, the data today. So a couple of key highlights from British Columbia, and, and this is something we see across the province and, and the analysis in the other provinces is ongoing. The first one is Christian hegemony. So we expected a lot of the prayers to 
come from a Christian background, given the, the population demographics and religious demographics of BC and Canada, but we weren't quite expecting to be 100% in BC. And this really underscores the exclusionary nature of, of legislative prayer. And these are some examples from council inaugural council meetings here in BC. Um, this is one where, you know, it ends in, in Jesus name. And uh, this is from, uh, from Dawson. And you can see how this ex inherently excludes non-believers. It also inherently excludes non-Christians. Um, this one here is actually one of the more alarming examples where not only does it, uh, it reinforce a very dominant Christian narrative, um, but it also seems to be implying some element of theocracy, um, suggesting that, um, that, 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 that a deity has, has provided leadership for the community. I thought, thought this one was quite telling insofar as it seems to undermine any sort of semblance of democratic elected process. And, and for those listening at home, um, the line is, um, let's pray, sovereign God, thank you for your concern for those who live in Parksville, evident today by your provision of this leadership for our community. Um, and, and to me, that really suggests the idea that, that the God character in this prayer has put um, the elected officials in power and not the elected, uh, the public who elected them. And I think that's kind of quite alarming. Um, when we explored uh, the, the prayers, there's, there's sort of three problems with secular, with the attempt to secular prayers. So one of the trends we've noticed, and this happened in Saguenay and across the country, and, and this is particularly the case in Ontario, and I'll, I'll touch on it when I get to Ontario. Um, in a bit more detail, but there is this idea that, oh, can we not just create secular prayers? So a prayer that, that accommodates everybody. There's three problems with that. Um, and I'll explore those briefly. There's probably more than three problems, but we highlight three, three major problems. Um, the first is the idea that, you know, in, so for example, here in Saanich, we had a blessing um, that was delivered by a Christian priest, a preacher, and then we had a multi-faith blessing. It was also delivered by a Christian preacher, but that didn't mention specific deities. It was sort of more poetic and um, ecumenical, if you will. And this, this was presented to me by our local mayor as, as an equitable solution. And the answer is no, it's actually not. Um, by having a blessing and then a multi-faith blessing, you are treating other non-Christian religions as guests in that space. So you're actually reinforcing Christian hegemony. You're saying, welcome to our space. Um, this is our space, but you're of course welcome to, to participate. Um, that again reinforces the space as being, you know, from a grounding of, of, of a Christian background. It also you know, relies on a sense of what constitutes normal religion, again, using heavy air quotes. And so you'll tend to see certain religious uh, denominations being reflected and the idea of like Judeo-Christian um, prayer, again, air quotes, um, being used. But by the same token, we don't necessarily see any municipalities inviting an Eck master to chant the hue of that, that particular sect or any other you know, non-standard, again, heavy air quotes, um, religious groups. And so there's also the element of like, how can a, a single guest possibly capture the diversity of views? So first of all, non-believers are excluded, but, but a vast range of non-Christian non religions are also excluded. And this is what Laurie Beeman described as the tainted neutrality of the secular. You create this vaguely Christian space. And, and that again reinforces the hegemony. The other two uh, challenges we found were the idea of assuming that prayer is universal. Um, in the Saguenay case, Saguenay and the mayor presented this idea that, oh, you can have a universal prayer. And this is what came up in the, um, uh, the, court, the Quebec Court of Appeals. And again, this is the idea of like grafting secular branches onto a Christian tree. We're gonna start a meeting with prayer, but of course, you know, our, our friend Bob can deliver a, any kind of invocation they want. Um, again, you're still fitting things within this, 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 this religious structure, even if there's a secular element to it. And again, as Saganay mentioned in the initial quote, this necessarily excludes non-believers. So in attempting to represent everyone, you ultimately fail to represent anyone. And that's not a good way of doing legislative prayer either. And on top of all that, again, and this is to reinforce this, this excludes non-believers. So, you know, Saguenay necessarily rejected the idea that you can craft a universal prayer. And as, a, as in the quote I've already included, you know, even if a religious practice um, engaged in by the state is inclusive, it may nevertheless exclude non-believers. So Saguenay is very clear. So we did a bit of activism around our report. We wrote to all the municipalities and um, reminded them of what Saguenay was. There was a series of letters and the copies of those letters are in the appendix of our, our BC report. And 16 responded out of 23 municipalities. 11 of them noted that they would take note. Um, the city of Langley passed a resolution accepting our letter. Two municipalities committed in writing to not include prayer in their inaugural sessions, and the township of Langley actively amended their procedures. So the reason I wanted to bring these up is 
it highlights the role for research and activism to work hand in hand. And um, the recommended process that I suggest is you start with a polite letter reminding folks that Saginaw exists. Many municipalities aren't aware of it. Uh, many of us are, but uh, you know, your average city clerk in a small town of Lumbee, for example, maybe didn't quite pick up on the message when it came out five years ago. And, and then you can, of course, um, increase the, the strength of the wording of letters. And what we're planning on doing here in BC is to send reminder letters out before the next round of inaugural meetings. We're going to continue to monitor compliance. And then after those inaugural meetings, any, if any municipalities still have prayer, we'll look at escalating the situation. And I think, I think this approach is really useful because it, it's less antagonistic at first. We have the law on our sides, so we have the constitution on our side. And so it's useful just to nudge municipalities in the right direction. And then if necessary, pursue things through, uh, through other means, usually through legal means. So let's take a jaunt across the country briefly before we jump into questions. And um, I, what I will do is I'll show you the results from each province. Um, I'm happy to, if anyone wants to know if their municipality is on the list, I'm happy to check that afterwards when we get to questions. And I'll highlight some of the interesting aspects for each province. The research outputs here, as I mentioned, are going to be a report for each province. And then Adriana and I are collaborating on an academic paper exploring the results on Saguenay compliance across the country. And we'll be presenting that at a conference this summer. Um, and then once it's out, we'll, we'll definitely send that around to all of our, our friends in the secular humanist world in Canada. So in Alberta, there, we looked at 178 municipalities, looking at all municipalities with a population of up to 1,000. We found eight with prayer in inaugural sessions and seven with prayer in general sessions. One thing that I thought was interesting here was it wasn't always the case that a municipality that had prayer in its inaugural sessions had prayer in its regular session and vice versa. And that's something that we're going to explore a little bit in the analysis on this report. Um, and that, that was kind of interesting. We, we also noticed that there were invocations and reflections and this will be the name that a municipality gives something. And this starts to hint at a trend that we noticed, and I'll, I'll cover this in more detail when we get to Ontario. In Saskatchewan, again, we looked at 113 municipalities with populations of over 1,000. We found six with prayer at inaugural sessions, two with prayer in general sessions. Um, and I should note an interesting observation was the 2020 municipal prayer uh, municipal elections occurred in Saskatchewan. And so we were able to compare the 2020 and the 2016 uh, election results. And an interesting notice, note was the previous municipal elections, they had five in their inaugural sessions and now it's six. So one municipality um, has added the practice of prayer um, since Saguenay um, and since 2016, which is interesting. And moving on to Manitoba, <laughs> This report was almost finished and then we uh, we found some news articles about the municipal uh, council in Winnipeg that had apparently done a legal review of their practice of prayer and decided that it was fine and is continuing to open its sessions with prayer. I'm not really sure who they asked to do this uh, review because if they'd read Saguenay, they would find that it was not acceptable. But what Winnipeg has been doing is they've been opening sessions with a rotation of uh, an invocation that uh, an individual counselor can deliver. So sometimes it's religious, sometimes it's not. Um, they thought this was okay. Saguenay says it's not. Um, and so we're currently just trying to get some FOIs and additional information um, around what their legal team thought uh, was the case. So we can include that in our report. But we did find 11 municipalities with prayer in their inaugural sessions, five with prayer in their general sessions. I will note that I am including minutes of silence, and we did notice uh, an increase in number of minutes of silence post Saguenay, particularly in Ontario. So again, for Ontario, there was a lot of municipalities with a population of over a thousand, and we found a, a very large number of municipalities that opened their sessions with prayer, especially their inaugural sessions, 158 in total. That's a lot of them. Um, now, we, we're in the process of analyzing those, but um, looking through them yesterday, I noticed that almost all of them were, were Christian preachers or members of the Christian clergy. Um, I did note that in a few instances, a prayer was delivered by a counselor or a mayor. And, and this introduces an interesting trend that we've noticed in Ontario, and that's what I call stealth prayer. So rather than overtly having the Lord's Prayer, which they open their provincial councils, uh, their provincial legislature with, um, you see this trend away from starting with prayer to starting with an invocation or a reflection. And very often the, they have a rotation of counselors who deliver that invocation on, on, on a general session. And in those cases, the idea is that it's not necessarily Christian. Anyone, anything can go. We have a time to open our session with reflection or invocation. It could be religious. It doesn't have to be. Uh, but again, recall my previous conversation around the idea of, of treating non-Christian religions as a guest in space. Um, 
that that that's that's a bit problematic still. <laughs> um, and so we're exploring this in this report in a bit more detail. But the idea of replacing a Christian prayer with a just slightly less Christian prayer doesn't address the core issue of Saguenay, which is any kind of invocation or reflection of this nature in a meeting is still a way of excluding non-believers and therefore not okay, not acceptable. And it's a democratic imperative that the state remain neutral on this matter. And so we're exploring the sort of nuance around that with the context of Ontario. And I should note that the municipalities involved, there are some large ones here. So York Regional Municipality, Mississauga, Hamilton, Simcoe, Markham, there's a lot of larger municipalities in Ontario that um, open their session, their inaugural sessions, and some of their general sessions with prayer. You'll notice a lot of minutes of silence as well, and a lot of municipalities adopted a minute of silence after Saguenay. And I haven't finished crunching the now, Adrian and I haven't finished crunching the analysis on that uh, to know how many have made those changes or, or possibly have made those changes, but it's considerable. And speaking of minutes of silence, we move on to Quebec. We only looked at 50 municipalities for Quebec um, because of the top 50 by population that we looked at, none of them had prayer. And um, only one had a minute of silence in their inaugural meeting. A lot of them had prayer in their um, general meetings. This is actually reflective of what happens in the uh, L'Assemblée Nationale, the Quebec legislature, where they started their sessions with prayer up until 1976, when the legislature adopted the policy of uh, a moment of, of reflection. And so you see the modeling of this at the um, at the provincial level, at the municipal level as well. And that's an interesting trend as well with, with Ontario. The Ontario uh, legislature opens its sessions with the Lord's Prayer, an overtly Christian prayer, and then a rotation of prayers from a small subset of other religious groups as guests in that space. Um, and so you can kind of see how the trend in a, um, a provincial legislature maybe influences the political culture of the province uh, towards you know, adopting a more um, a prayer in their municipal levels. Heading over to the Maritimes now, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, we did the top 50 municipalities by population. We only found one with prayer in their inaugural sessions, one with prayer in their general sessions. And um, what's interesting here is Newfoundland and Labrador uh, has never opened its provincial legislature with prayer. It's the only um, province or territory in Canada where that's been the case. And uh, we, we're starting to get into some data deficiencies. So we have a, quite a high percentage of, of we don't knows. Um, and we're still trying to follow up on those. Um, again, my amazing research team and particularly Adriana have been doing a lot of heavy lifting, trying to uh, exchange emails with municipalities across the country. Over to PEI, uh, again, looking at the top 50, we didn't find any that started with prayer, although we are still quite data deficient for inaugural meetings. And for general meetings, uh, we found a nun with prayer and our data is a bit better. One of the reasons why the data is harder to find for inaugural sessions towards the Maritimes and in many provinces is because inaugural meetings, because they don't have a set agenda, um, they aren't doing any legislation at that meeting, they'll often just have a summary sheet of like people were sworn in <laughs> and there was a bagpiper. And so unless you can find the audiovisual recording of that meeting, you don't actually know the elements of it. Whereas for regular sessions, if there's a prayer, it'll often be included in the agenda. Although we, we did check to make sure that um, it wasn't simply included in the agenda, uh, it wasn't included in the meeting, but not the agenda by watching video recordings when they were available. Um, back to New Brunswick, we found uh, four municipalities with prayer and uh, in the general and inaugural sessions. And then in the general sessions and also inaugural ones, we started again to see this trend of, okay, well, we don't have prayer, but we have a reflection, or we don't have prayer, but we have a prayer or a reflection, or we have an opening word. And these are all different kinds and ways of framing introductory prayer. So in the report of New Brunswick, and we haven't got to it quite yet, but when we get to it, we'll be exploring this sort of, this nuance of calling something something slightly different whether that changes it. Um, it doesn't, <laughs> whether it's a prayer or a blessing or a reflection or an opening word or an invocation. Um, if you're starting your meeting with one of these elements and it has a religious underpinning, then it would violate Saguenay. Over to Nova Scotia, um, again, looking at 50 municipalities by population, we found one with an inaugural session with prayer and some minutes of silence in general sessions. Um, and now our data was not as robust for the territories. Uh, it was harder to find information. And also we have a few uh, smaller number of municipalities. So looking at the Yukon, we had the top eight municipalities and none of them had prayer. We, we weren't able to find data for one of them. Um, similarly for the Northwest territories, we're quite data deficient here. And we had one with prayer. And, um, and again, for Nunavut, there was prayer in one municipality. We looked at the top 25, just given the population and, and municipalities up there. And, um, and we're still exploring the data on those, so I, I won't speak too deeply into the territories. Um, 
at, at this point. But there, there is, again, in this situation, there are some crossovers with Indigenous content, and that's something that we'll be exploring in those reports. So, um, so I'm excited to get to people's questions. Um, there's work to be done. So basically, one of the, the overarching themes of the BC Humanist Research Team has been using good research to achieve change in our society, making our society more secular, helping reinforce the separation of religion and government. And so we'll be releasing our reports um, as, they, as we finish them in the coming months. Um, I won't speculate which, uh, as to which the next one is because we're still waiting on data from uh, Manitoba, but we're working on Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba, and, and those reports will be out soon. And one of our hopes is that our allies and, and, and friends across the country will use that information um, to do advocacy in their communities. We've had a lot of success here in BC simply emailing municipalities and it has helped to have a, be a local organization. So if you're part of a provincial organization or a local regional one or a municipal one, that is more significant than if a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, kale smoothie drinking folks from out in British Columbia send a strongly worded email to a small municipality in Ontario. Um, but we also, you know, as the situation emerges, it'll be important to have people on the ground who can personally object to these practices in council meetings, because those people, those will be the people who have standing in those communities so they can pursue those issues through tri uh, human rights tribunals or courts if necessary. The one fortunate thing about this case is Saguenay is very clear. It's, it's not wishy-washy in the least. You cannot have prayer in a municipal council meeting. It is a violation of the state's duty of, of religious neutrality. It is a democratic imperative. And so, you know, regardless of how things are wiggled around and slightly changed and municipalities try to get around it through different means, it cannot be occurring. And so we have a very strong initial position and we can use that um, to push forward and to achieve change. And just lastly, we'll note that there, there are other instances of legislative prayer or prayer in meetings across Canada that are also problematic. Um, we aren't doing this right away, but we will be looking at in the future uh, prayer in university convocations. Universities are heavily publicly funded and many of them will include prayer elements um, and that may or may not violate Saguenay, but it certainly violates the state's duty of religious neutrality. And uh, we're also looking at legislatures. So we've been doing extensive work here in the BC legislature, which continues to open its sessions with prayers. Although we had a small victory, um, they've changed it uh, as a result of our advocacy, that is, they've changed it from prayers to prayers and reflections as a result of us pushing them quite hard. Um, and they've expanded their list of sample prayers to be slightly more um, <laughs> inclusive of other religious groups, um, although it's still um, heavily religious. And um, we're, we're, we crunch the, crunch the data on that on a regular basis. And um, I'll share a link in a few minutes here to the religious practices and prayers in other uh, provincial municipalities. And I will note that there is some question around whether Saguenay applies in those cases because of parliamentary privilege. This hasn't directly been tested out in the courts um, in recent years. And there's been some, some controversy around it in the courts in the past. Um, and so I'm interested to see if parliamentary privilege does protect discriminatory practices in legislatures. Um, it shouldn't. Uh, parliamentary privilege is important and it's an important part of legislatures, but it, sh it most people would agree that it doesn't include things like if a legislature passed a rule that said that women couldn't be elected officials, that, that would be a violation um, of, of basic human rights and parliamentary privilege should not protect that. And if it is, then there's a problem with parliamentary privilege. And so this is sort of the overall um, theme of what the BC humanists have been doing as part of our, our research and activism. And I'll leave it at that and go to questions. Um, because I'm excited to see what people have to say. And I'm going to pop a couple of links in the chat just while we're checking out the questions. And maybe Anna, if you wanted to, because I know the questions are being ranked, if you wanted to pop some, uh, let me know which questions you want to go to. Uh, that would be great. Uh, sure. So uh, thank you very much, Teal, for the presentation. Uh, a comment from Secular Ontario. Uh, in Ottawa. In 2006, Secular Ontario contacted municipalities around the province of Ontario to request them to refrain from saying prayers at council meetings, referencing the Henry Freitag case. Yeah. We took one municipality to court and won. So just... Uh, I was actually just talking to someone from them <laughs> yesterday and yes, yeah, the Freitag Fre 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 case was the previous one and um, Saguenay really was even more dramatically powerful in that case. And I know other people have been doing advocacy around this, um, particularly in local context, and we're really excited to have sort of the macro report. But yeah, the check and see if your local municipality does include prayer. And then you can do local activism or, or broader, depending on your, your capacity and the, your reach. I'm just popping chat, uh, some links in the chat here, folks. And so you're welcome to explore some of our recent research. So go ahead, Anne. 
Okay, a question from Ashu. Are you taking any actions to get the municipalities with prayer recitations to respect the Supreme Court decisions and decision? And I think you, you uh, talked about that a little bit. I don't know if you wanna uh, give some additional information or how yeah. people can get involved in that specifically with BCHA, for example. Absolutely, yeah, so we are. So um, the main thing, and I'll put my email here in the chat. Um, because basically what we're doing is, and sorry, I'm just bombarding folks with links. This is our recent research on legislative prayer and some content on taxes. So if anyone is interested in going on a, a deep dive into our, <laughs> our back catalog, they're welcome to. But yeah, so our plan is to do ongoing activism. We are particularly looking for folks outside of BC to step up and help us with um, releasing the report in that province. We want to work with local folks to make sure that we're not just swooping in with research. Many of you, as, as our friends in, um, in Secular Ontario have already noted, I've been doing advocacy around this for years. And so our goal was to take our research and, and hand it to people in different provinces so that they can then use that to achieve outcomes. And um, yeah, our, our, I, if you have, if you're part of a local group, provincial, regional, municipal, um, please get in touch and we'll share our reports with you when they come out. And then the idea is to create a bit of a news hoopla around them um, and also to work on communication before the report comes out because as i mentioned it, it helps to have um it, it helps to have you know just a, a casual nudge a polite nudge before we do some sort of more uh, targeted activism uh, because a lot of municipalities they want to change they want to follow the constitution they should um and so for that so in that case the plan is to just nudge them in the right direction and then if they dig in their heels then we can explore other options uh, it, just if folks are looking to see what I put in the chat and it is scrolling fast pretty fast, um, just go to the BC Humanist website um, and there's there's a link to all of our different research projects there because I just bombarded the chat with a bunch of work. Also, if you go to my website, teal.ca, there is a uh, teal with an E, uh, there is a page of, of publications and you can go through them and see the ones that are humanist related there. Or you can read about sea cucumber crime in India, a, a recent publication of mine, um, which is not related to uh, secular humanism, but it's also very important. <laughs> Okay, from Peter. I'm interested in this from a legal and political viewpoint. I know that the Saguenay case has been cited legally in more than 500 decisions. Uh, the question of neutrality is a crucial one. While our city council, Niagara Falls, has other faults, they do not start meetings with a prayer, yet the swearing in ceremony has a non denominational prayer. Uh, yes, so I'm just going to check my, my database, see what, what we got for Niagara. Uh... So yeah, yeah, we found uh, Niagara region. You said Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. So yeah, they're, they're, the inaugural meeting started with a uh, last inaugural meeting started with a prayer by Father Chris Kulig. He is a Christian Catholic male, um, and the regular sessions don't necessarily start with a prayer. So yeah, that's that's an, that's one of the examples. And Niagara Falls has a population in 2016 of 88,000. So that's an instance of Saguenay being violated. And so a polite letter to Niagara Falls Council reminding them that that should be excluded and it's not part of Saguenay would be in order. Um, and then, you know, following up to see if they if they don't um, change their practices in the future. We, we know that this is a longer game because inaugural sessions happen every four years. And um, that's where we're noticing a lot of the prayer. But I do like the, the sort of the stepped approach where basically you send them a letter now and then after, right before the next inaugural meeting, and then after the next inaugural meeting, if they continue to have prayer, you have a paper trail that establishes that you have raised Saguenay to them. They, they aren't ignorant of Saguenay at this point. So then what they're doing then is intentional. And then you can explore, um, it gives you a stronger, a stronger legal position. And then you find a local person in the community with standing who can pursue the issue a bit further. Uh, next question, do the quasi prayers of First Nations run afoul of the Supreme Court decision? We don't know. Um, so we have, a, we have an article um, called Decolonizing uh, Prayer, which explores um, prayer and in territorial invocation, uh, territorial acknowledgments in the BC legislature and some of the issues and nuance around that. It hasn't been tested in the courts. And I, I don't I wouldn't speculate um, as to how it would, it would emerge if it did go to the courts. This is why we kind of treat it as a separate section. There is, there seems to be, there is something different about a territorial, a traditional welcome, for example, or a drumming ceremony, as opposed to um, a 10 minute sermon, as was the case in some uh, uh, Manitoba municipalities. There seems to be something that's different and I would be interested to see what the courts have to say on it. And I've considered, been considering this for a couple of years since we started the issue of looking into legislative prayer. And um, I can see lots of different sides to it. I think what's critical in this situation to, to consider is that traditional welcomes do have a really important role to play in reconciliation and they don't necessarily have to have religious content. So for example, and this isn't 
and these interesting tensions. You'll have a traditional welcome where an elder will welcome folks to unceded territory and talk about their culture. Um, that seems, you know, that seems really a really important element to include in an inaugural meeting. You have bagpipes after all. Um, and but, but on the other hand, you know, for example, here in Saanich, we had an Indigenous person give a welcome that was very Christian, that was talking about Jesus. Um, and so there's tension there. But then, of course, there's also tension relating to inviting someone to your council chambers to give their traditional territorial welcome and then telling them they can't have religious elements to it would seem like an extension of colonialism. So there's a lot of different elements to explore within it. And it's something we're still we're still exploring. And I, I would be interested to see what happens um, when it goes to the courts. But I, I, I'm still, still exploring the issue, and so I wouldn't necessarily uh, speculate. Considering the accusation of Islamophobia, could municipal prayer for by Christians be a way of saying we Christians are correct, you others are wrong? I think that question kind of reflects on the point I was making around guests. So the idea of saying, okay, we're going to have this ecumenical prayer or th this prayer delivered by a, a priest um, reflects all people is somehow universal. I, I don't think it's necessarily Islamophobic. It's probably not the right term to use in this case, but it certainly is excluding other views and other religious groups. And you know, the one that made me chuckle was here in Saanich, where the the um, the, no, the multi faith blessing was still delivered by a, a member of the Christian clergy. And while it didn't mention God, it was actually quite well written as far as a secular invocation goes. Um, it seemed a bit of a stretch to think that you know we couldn't find someone from a non Christian faith to deliver that but also that the city wouldn't bother checking that neither of those options were, were acceptable. A uh, question from Galen, what if they hide their done prayers? Yes, yeah, so no, that's a really good question. So this is, um, and I think this is hinting at a practice that happens in the, the, um, the legislature in uh, the United Kingdom. So the tradition that we have under the Westminster model is that, and, and in the UK, prayer opens their legislative sessions, but the public is not allowed in and it's not hansardized. There's no video, there's no written record of it. And this reflects the private nature of prayer. A couple of municipal, uh, provincial legislatures do this in Canada. And um, for example, here in British Columbia, while the public is present for prayer and they're recorded, which is why we were able to transcribe over a thousand of them, um, they're not hansardized. Whereas the rest of the content in the legislature is recorded and hansard, which is the written, uh, written record of what happens in the legislature. So yes, that's a really good point. What if they hide them? We've done as much as we can to try to find instances of prayer. So for example, we've gone through the minutes, we've watched videos if they're available, um, but we, we obviously would have potentially miss some if they're kind of concealed. If, for example, counselors are meeting in private before a session starts to pray, that's okay. Um, an individual or a group of people can can do, you know, the, the idea, the problem with Saguenay is not individuals having religious, uh, the ability to express their religious views. It's when they're acting in an official capacity um, representing the state. So if you had members of Parksville Council here in, in, on, um, in, in BC, wanted to get together and have a little prayer session before the council session starts, that's fine. Um, as long as it's not part of the agenda and officially part of the session. Uh, and so, yeah, this, if they hide it really well and we can't find it, can't do much about that. Um, but if it's part of the, the official agenda and part of the official process of a meeting, then it, 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 that's a problem that violates Saguenay. Okay, here's a longer comment from Carol. In the region of Peel in the GTA, our local school board has adopted Christian Heritage, Heritage Month, Hindu Heritage Month, Islamic and Sikh Heritage Months, where the heritages of all these religions are celebrated in the school classroom through the reading of books at the elementary level. I've been trying to point out, point out to them for a year and a half now that the state is not permitted to do so under the charter. So if you want to, I'll just yeah, leave it back I, if you want to follow up on that. I don't know the particular nuance of, of school boards. I know this is always controversial around you know school prayer, for example. We no longer start our sessions with uh, or school days with prayer. Um, this is an interesting question, depending on how it's approached. Right. So the question of like teaching religion in schools is always a hot button topic because it is important to introduce people to a wide range of religious views. But I've read a lot of literature that explores why it's very hard to do so in a non-biased way and why that becomes, you know, there's controversy around that. Um, this issue in particular, though, declaring a sort of a heritage month where people learn about a particularly different different cultural or religious group um, might start entering into the territory of the charter that explores promoting multiculturalism. Um, and so I, I'm, not a, I'm not a lawyer, so I wouldn't comment on the legality of it. It might be worth bouncing it past someone who has a bit more um, direct legal experience in that context. But it, it does raise like the complicated issue of 
yes, religious education is important. Like teaching people about religions, world religion class can be very valuable, but teaching people religion as truth is obviously not okay. So it's one of those aspects that I think um, would depend on the context. So if it's just, we're gonna teach you about Sikhism, um, that that seems you know not unreasonable. Um, whereas if it's, you know, this is true, here's the truth of you know, Mormonism, that would, would seem problematic. Um, but yeah, it, it, there's a lot of nuance around um, schools and school boards and, um, it's not something we've dived, dived into too much, so I won't speak more on from too much of a position of, uh, of knowledge beyond that. Okay, thank you. From Michelle, as you mentioned earlier, the duty of a uh, state according to the Saguenay decision is not only to be neutral, but also to appear to be neutral. What are the consequences of this dual obligation in other government departments besides town halls? I think that there's there's two ways on to that question. There's what how it should be and how it is. Um, and this kind of reflects some of the other links I posted in the in the Zoom chat. And for folks who are commenting, I'm putting those in the Zoom chat, but we can, um, Anna can link some of the, or myself, or someone can put them on the Facebook uh, pages later on. Um, in an ideal world, the state would be completely neutral. And that would mean not having prayer at open legislative sessions. It would mean treating all recipients of tax exemptions equally. It would mean not setting aside special time during in convocations, municipal meetings to, to, to pray or to include prayer. Um, so I think that would be the ideal world. If, if, here's some examples of some of the things we're looking at with taxes. So here in British Columbia, we have tax policy where a place of worship can receive a tax exemption and uh, like a boys and girls rowing club can receive a tax exemption. Fair enough, if they're both providing a benefit to the community, um, that seems reasonable. But one of them is only providing benefit to its members and one of them is open to the public. Or um, one of them, the rowing club, is you know doesn't discriminate against people, whereas another one of them, a particular place of worship, might exclude members of a certain community, um, or run a commercial operation, um, or violate COVID regulations overtly. Um, and so we see this interesting tension where places of worship and religion are given more privilege. Um, and for example, in tax policy, um, clergy, uh, we have a report coming out soon on clergy residencies receiving tax exemptions. Uh, Adriana, my colleague Adriana is working on that one, and. I don't get a tax exemption from my place of residence, but a member of the clergy does. And sometimes that's necessary for them to operate as a member of the clergy. That's problematic because we are then subsidizing the functioning of a religious um, entity. So, so I think the answer is in an ideal world, the state would be neutral. And that would mean if someone wants to apply for funding or a tax exemption, they're treated, all of them are treated the same. Um, and they have to demonstrate their benefit or demonstrate why they're worthy of receiving funding. But that's currently not the case. So particularly with tax exemptions, um, if I have a, a rowing club and I want to apply for funding, um, a, a tax exemption, I have to write an application. And every here in Saanich, every five years, I have to reapply. If I have a place of worship, I receive it automatically and I don't have to apply ever again. And there's no checks and balances to ensure that what I'm doing is actually benefiting the community, not excluding people, not discriminating. Um, and you know, for example, the one that's come up recently in our report on, um, on tax exemptions. I'll, I'll put this one back in the chat because I know some folks are asking for it. Um, but on, on our report on tax exemptions, we have places of worship here in British Columbia, and I'm sure it is the case across the, um, the country that um, the places of worship are receiving tax subsidy while overtly violating sanitary uh, COVID regulations designed to keep people safe. Um, that's a huge problem. So yeah, I just popped to the, the chat to the, the, the tax policy in there. And I'll put one other link to a report because I know folks are asking for them um, for our paper for British Columbia. But yeah, I'll fire away with another question, please. Uh, Teal, sorry, a couple of people are saying that they cannot see your links in the chat. Right. Um, I think it might just be because there's so much chat going on here. And but... for for the listeners, please, if you have a question, can you please type it in the Q and A? Yes. Um, so that it's not confusing because it's all mixed up with the links. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a, there's a bit of a comment chaos yeah, there. So yeah, I just put the chat to our tax paper that came up two weeks ago in the, in the, in the Zoom chat. The last one is our report from British Columbia. And then um, if folks are interested, I'll just put the decolonizing prayer one in there because that one, we really explore the issue of um, territorial acknowledgements and, and some of the complexities around that um, as well. Yeah, and by the way, these are great questions and the, the one thing I love about exploring legislative prayer is the ruling on Saguenay is so clear that it really does allow us to do some really targeted advocacy and, and really focused research. Okay, does Toronto Council have a prayer? Ah, good question. Uh, let me just check. I don't think Toronto, Toronto does. Uh, Toronto has a minute of silence and in both its regular and its inaugural sessions. 
And by the way, uh, for our full reports, we will have a list of all the municipalities with their practices in a table in the appendixes and with um, uh, transcriptions of the prayers themselves. So if you look at the last link I posted in there, that's our BC report, and we'll be replicating that same model for each province. Um, they're going to be long <laughs> because there's a lot of them. Um, so I anticipate our Ontario report's going to start weighing in at a couple, you know, maybe 70 pages or something, but uh, a lot of it will be just data that will help give information to activists on the ground. It is clear from court decisions that Saigene has a wider application than mere municipal meetings. Uh, it has application in other areas of law, including employment and prayer in a religious organization. Yes. Can you comment on that? Please? Absolutely. Okay, so I'm just going to post one more link in here. This is legislative practices across the country. Um, yes, it absolutely does. So the example I would have here is, and this is talked about in our public good report on tax exemptions, the charter applies to government which means governments can't discriminate based on charter rights. If people want to open a private club that's discriminatory, like a, a bigots only club, they can. Um, they just can't receive tax funding through any level of government. Um, and we start seeing this reflected in some of the practices around the Canada Summer Jobs Grant program. So we've been very lucky at the BCHA to have, I think last summer we had three summer researchers and they done a lot of the heavy lifting on this research. So full respect to them. Um, but on top of that, um, the, with respect, oh, I've lost my train of thought here. Um, yeah, right. So this Canada Summer Jobs Grant, there was a, con a controversy two years ago when Trudeau announced that they would not be giving Canada Summer Jobs Grants to people who, organizations that opposed a person's right to choose what happens to their body, groups that are actively working to undermine people's access to abortion. And this was a controversy and the government went back and forth on it and then ruled finally that no, if an organization is actively undermining human rights, a fundamental right for someone to choose, um, they cannot receive a Canada Summer Jobs Grant. And um, this was uh, significant because I think it applies in many situations. And I think the question was a really good one because we can take the same logic to tax exemptions. So going back to our tax exemption report, if you have a place of worship that has a soup kitchen that benefits members of the community, it's publicly available, anyone can go to that session, they deserve a tax exemption. Sure, we need more soup kitchens. Great, good stuff. But if they require you to listen to a sermon beforehand, or they have a, a no gays allowed sign on the door, heavy air quotes again, friends, um, then they shouldn't receive public funding. And they are. There are definitely discriminatory places of worship that are receiving public subsidy through tax exemptions that are operating in a discriminatory way. And so this, this oper Saguenay offers the opportunity to, to really push for true separation of religion and government in Canada to make sure that our state is neutral with respect to religion. Okay, just uh, to double check, Teal, would you be able to compile the links? Oh, apparently just someone just said, I'm just saying all panelists. Yes, yes thank you. That's yeah, what all, I was doing. All panelists, yeah, not sure if you, yeah. I was just saying to Anna, so Anna's got a whole collection of quotes, links there. What I'll do is I'll put all the links with little headers and I'll email them to Anna right after the talk here and make sure that gets around to people because I think, yes, thank you, uh, Ruben, a couple of people have noted that I've been spamming the chat and it's been only going to Anna and Mark. So um, yes. yeah, we'll make sure that everyone gets the links there. And um, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. So please reach out to me for the links and the PowerPoint slides. Would you be able to share those as well? Yeah, for sure, no problem. We've got a request. Um, okay, we have a couple of minutes left. So maybe a few more questions. I still cringe at the word God keep our land in the national anthem that was added in 1980. Why is it still there? This is another example. I know there was a big effort um, in all of us commands, the first change to the national anthem, which really did establish the precedent for changing it. Um, I've explored the literature on this a bit more in the United States in that context, because they have this idea of their, their civic religion. So in the States where they have a very clear separation of religion and government in their, their constitution, they still have you know, a lot of religious content in their sessions. They have paid um, clergy members, have a <laughs> paid clergy member for their legislatures. Um, so we've been exploring that in, in, in some detail. It's a problem and it's something we had to move away from. Um, I always try to do a blended version of the French and English, which avoids all the sort of religious content, which it, it re revol results in a sort of meandering session through a multilinguist adventure. Um, but yeah, you know, th this is one of the things that we, we can't um, ignore. Uh, and for example, even the preamble to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms includes God. But Saguenay was very clear on that as well, that that refers to a political philosophy and not to an actual deity, um, despite people's um, admonitions that it does not. But yeah, good, good point. And it, I mean, there's, this, I think, underscores the need for all of the organizations like Humanist Canada, BCHA, and our, our allies across the country to be working on this issue. There's still a lot of, uh, in both 
overt and covert incorporation of religious elements in our political structures. And that necessarily excludes non-believers and people from non-majoritarian religions as well. That can't be forgotten. So there's a lot of work to be done. So we're, <laughs> it keeps our research team busy and our whiteboard of possible ideas or future projects very full. Okay, maybe we can take two more questions. If that's oh, okay. I'm happy to take a few yeah. more, yeah. And I'm, okay. I'll, while I'm doing this, I'll actually post the links into the actual chat for attendees here. <laughs> okay, how could Second A be used to promote change in Ontario's Education Act, which states that- I'm not familiar with- yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. I've, sorry, jump, 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 jump me in there. I'm not familiar with Ontario's Education Act, so I'm not sure. Um, I, would talk, I would recommend talking to like legal counsel on this so you can build a case. In any of these situations where you you want to have you want to have legal standing, so you want to be a, a parent in that school district or that region, and then have the ability to have a grounding in, in some sort of you know like grounding in the area and, and the reason why you would have received harm from the, the changes. But I, I won't speak to that because I, I don't know the details of Ontario and and I won't want to give legal advice because I'm definitely not qualified to do that. Uh, okay, Till, can you please share your Facebook page link? Um, if you haven't done so, I lost track of all the links that you're sharing. I'm just so going to share. Some, someone is asking, yeah, for or maybe uh, BCH. Yeah, is, um, so is the last link I just put in here is the my my list of publications where I've kept all publications that I've done in the last few years, and the BCHA also has that on their website. So we'll, um, we'll make sure that there's a posted perhaps with the event on your the Humanist Canada Facebook page or something. There's a, a page with all the links. Um, and I, the last few did go to the panelists. I hope. <laughs> Okay, and finally, last question. I have been complaining for years to the government for not including a humanist efficient in Remembrance Day ceremony. See your mm -hmm. advice. I will say two things. One is um, we received some comments from folks around the need for um, uh, secular humanist invocations at meetings. So our team is actually working on a guide to delivering secular invocations. Um, we recognize that there's a need, you know, you have these ceremonies where you want to say something and there seems to be a tendency to, to add religious elements. And, and obviously with Remembrance Day ceremonies, there is strong religious iconography and religious content. And part of that reflects the history of the event and, and people involved. And I won't weigh into some of the nuance around that. But um, yeah, as far as um, having officiants, the first thing I think is, and this is again, just speculating, um, my colleague Ian uh, Bushfield, who's our executive director, uh, has worked a lot more on, on secular officiants for weddings. But the first step, I think, is to make sure that you have the ability to have secular officiants, whether it's for Remembrance Day ceremonies, but particularly for weddings, right? So if you, you know, the fact that someone has to be a member of religious clergy to officiate a wedding or to, to grant, you know, get people married is a bit problematic, again, favoring religion over non-religion. So I would, I would work on making sure that your jurisdiction has the ability to have secular officiants in general, and then approach the organizers of events with, you know, hey, we would like this person to be included. Um, and if you have, if you'd like some advice on, on what to say at those events, our guide, it's not on the top of our list at the moment, um, but we will be releasing that in a little while. And um, we do have a link actually on our website where we're soliciting people uh, to submit examples of secular invocations. And I will have to dig that up on our website um, and share with folks in a little while. But uh, yeah, the idea is um, we're, we're inviting people to share their favorite quotes or their favorite invocations that we can then share as examples. Um, so you have a, basically a booklet of here's how to give an invocation. Here's some examples of invocations you can give and um, helping people in that way. I'm happy to take a few more questions if folks are willing to stick it out while I, <laughs> I can find that link. Okay. So uh, I'm so, to find a link to the uh, secular invocations here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Till, for the presentation. And thank you all for your questions, as always. Uh, maybe uh, uh, if uh, we haven't answered some of the questions, uh, you can follow up with uh, Till on his Facebook page. Would yeah, be okay? and, uh, yeah, there's a contact or, or, form yeah. on my website there as well if you want to get in touch. And I think the critical thing here is if you are part of a regional group, provincial group, local organization, um, get in touch and I'll put you on our list so that when we we start producing the report for your province. We can share it with you and work with you to make sure that we're doing the most effective advocacy around it. One of the things I've noticed is that there tends to be sort of a, a cookie cutter approach across the country where I know there's been some amazing work done in certain municipalities. And it usually is just one individual who's really stepping up to, to fight for separation of religion and government. And one of our hopes and the reason why we want to expand our research project across the country was to, to help and empower and, and, and supply people with the tools needed to do it at a broader level. Um, so, you know, I'll be uh, keeping an eye on my local municipality, but by the same token, um, those 158 municipalities with inaugural prayer in Ontario, uh, we need to be keeping an eye on them as well. And um, 
one of the things there is, and my hope is that we monitor the situation moving forward. And then we're able to identify really good cases that we can then take forward from a legal perspective. I hope we don't have to have them. I would hope that most municipalities when presented with the law, the constitution and also the harms of including prayer would decline. Um, but those that dig in their heels, um, we wanna find some great cases that we can then pursue. And those will serve as examples to reinforce Saginaw further, which will then have a knock on effect. But I mean, the overall thing, which I think is really fascinating is that we have Supreme Court ruling that's so clear and that compliance is so weak across the country. So it's really important to continue to, to monitor compliance even after we've achieved a victory like Saginaw. Yeah, definitely a uh, to be continued conversation. Yeah, well, definitely. And if any of your regional organizations want to talk uh, for your province or region, let me know. We're always happy to throw some of our research team and to give you a presentation. It's very easy on Zoom here. I don't have to jump on a bus or fly over to Lumbee or, or Muskoka or wherever. Right. Welcome to the new world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, as we wrap, our, uh, wrap up our session, I would like to mention that uh, we are supported by memberships and donations. So if you would like to contribute to our educational programs, including the webinars, you can do so on our website. And also, if you're joining us for the first time and would like to become a member of Humanist Canada, uh, please join us and do so on the website as well. And uh, finally, uh, an announcement, our next webinar will take place on April 25th at 3 p.m. As always, and our guest speaker will be a research and author Mark Schaus, and he will talk about the progress of secular movements occurring around the world. And as always, you can find more information about that on our website, social media, and in the newsletter. Again, thank you, Teal, for uh, being here, for joining us today. And uh, thank, thank you, you all. Yeah. Thank you all for attending. Have a lovely evening. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Bye.